Welcome to All Write in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker, and me, Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian. Our guest today is Jade Wallace. Jade holds an MA in creative writing from the University of Windsor and writes poetry, novels, and short fiction, serves as the inaugural book reviews editor for Carousel, and is co-founder of the collaborative writing entity MADE. Jade's work has been published in literary journals internationally and has been shortlisted for the BP Nickel Chapbook Award. Their writing has also been nominated for the Journey Prize. In addition to Jade's own writing, Jade works on poetry and fiction editing, manuscript consulta- consultation, ghost writing, workshops, and readings. Jade's debut novel, Anomia, adapted from their Governor General's gold medal winning thesis, will be released by Palimpsest Press in spring 2024. Jade, I should have asked, did I pronounce that? title correctly yes you did yay okay well welcome back to the show Uh, it's lovely to have you here again and thank you so much for having me oh pleasure and congratulations on your first novel so one of the exciting features of this novel is that there are no pronouns in this whole work and you carry it off so well one of your characters slip muses that it is better to presume a plurality than a singularity Why did you decide to take on this challenge and how challenging was it for you? (laughs) Well, I first had the idea that I wanted to do this, gosh, maybe a decade ago, which I guess speaks to how challenging it is that I only just finally uh, finished the novel. Well, technically a couple of years ago now, but yeah, it, there are, I suppose in a certain sense, Well, no. In one sense, there are pronouns. There are like first person singular, first person plural, second person, that kind of thing. But I specifically avoided first person singular pronouns, which are, of course, the pronouns of controversy these days. Um, He, she, they, and then a variety of sort of neo pronouns. Um, And I really wanted a novel to look at what, like how we could represent human life just completely without gender. And I felt it was a bit of a cop out to use like, quote unquote, neutral pronouns, because of course, those have their own connotations of neutrality or like a kind of third genderness. Um, And I didn't want any of that. I was just like, what if it's just absent? Like, you just can't see it at all. Um, And it was not just the pronouns, of course, it was also things like, well, what would you not have in a world that doesn't have gender? Well, you wouldn't have things like segregated bathrooms. Um, You wouldn't, I think, have things like gendered, like gender based violence, like all these all these kinds of implications of that. And so trying to figure out how that would impact not only the representation of the characters, but also how it would affect the plot, frankly, um, were a number of issues I had to work out. And it was like difficult, but difficult in in a way that uh, I deeply enjoy. (laughs) Yeah, I should have mentioned, said that. There, I mean, there are obviously some in there. And just a, as an observation, after a while, you don't notice it. Only until something like a parent is mentioned as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and often people are, are referred to by their jobs, such as bartender. Was that one of the, the challenges that, that came up? Was sort of referring pe- to people by what if, they do rather than yeah. who they were? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, that's what... I'll say one, I'll say two things. So one is the parent role was actually the hardest. I like, that was the one I think challenge of this novel. I'm still not satisfied with Um, calling someone the parent uh, felt, eh, it still feels a little stilted to me. So that was like the one thing that just still irks me a little bit about how I pulled this off. But in general, I actually found it um, not so difficult and like almost intuitive to sort of refer to people based on their roles. And those roles, of course, are not absolute. They were completely contextual. Like there's, for example, 
um, the trailer park manager who's just called the manager. And I suppose in other areas of that person's life, they're probably not known as the manager. They're like a parent or they are, I don't know, an artist or whatever they do in the rest of their life. But in this context, for the characters around them, they are the manager. And, and that felt, like I said, intuitive to me because I think a lot of the ways we relate to people are in many contexts, like a workplace or, or landlord or whatever, like the, and there's landlord gendered word. I did not use the word landlord in the novel. Don't worry. Um, like a lot of those roles are very much prescribed and they're very um, sort of constrained in terms of like the dynamics of the roles. And so it's easy to just default to like, what is, what is the prescribed relationship apart from gender? Um, and as you said, there are ways that gender comes up, of course, like we love to gender jobs for some reason, even though that has really no impact on a person's ability to do the job. But um, those were less hard to avoid because I think there has actually been a social effort to sort of like de-gender jobs a little bit. Like we don't, you know, say police woman anymore. Or we don't say whatever, like we default to something like firefighter or police officer or things like that, you know, things that are already sort of like neutralized. Um, and I feel like I totally lost the thread of your question. I hope I answered it. You certainly did. And, I, you know, I couldn't help think those of us of a certain age remember Saturday Night Live and the parental unit. I just kept <laughs> inserting that. Yeah, I remember that as well. Like Slip, the names of your characters are non-gendered and almost otherworldly, like Fur, Fane, Blue, and Limb. How did you choose them and how do you feel they fit in with the tone of this work? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. I uh, I actually really love the process of naming the characters. I in general like that process, but particularly here. In a in an er I would say an earlier version of the novel, but like for most of the novel's life, the characters actually did not have even vaguely human sounding names. Um, Slip's original sort of nomenclature was the little ghost. Um and so I was sort of referring to them in these like poetic or descriptive ways, which was like enjoyable for my writing process and sort of helped me conceive of them in my mind. But at a certain point, I was like, I actually want these to still be characters. Like, I don't want you to feel like you're reading caricatures just because they don't have a gender. So I was like, OK, I've got to I've got to give them names, like actual names. But the thing with human names, is like even, you know, names that are sort of unisex or whatever, they carry so much baggage with them in terms of like, you know, they remind us of particular people, whether those are celebrities or people in our lives or whatever. And I was like, real names have so much connotation, even when we don't, even if they don't semantically have a lot of connotation, we just have like all these associative meanings with them. Um, so I was like, I'm just going to pick names that like no one ever calls human beings <laughs> like Culver. Culver is a word, but you I don't as far as I can tell, like no one is actually named Culver. And if it is, it's like a complete anomaly. So I wanted names that sounded human, but that really aren't generally applied to actual people. Um, and so you kind of, I hope, evade that like trap of association. Like, what do you associate Culver with? I don't know. How, how do you even know what to associate it with? Um, and I tried to pick sort of like more obscure words that you might have heard before, but good luck placing them. Um Except for Slip, of course, who, like, I thought that was just a fun name because it's literally, like, referring to kind of, like, the slippage of language. Um, yeah. Anyways, I had, I had great fun naming the characters. These character names are a lot, also a lot like flora and fauna in the landscape. Nature itself seems like another character, which is very similar to your poetry. Would you agree with that? Was that intentional? Absolutely. Um, I'm... I'm very much of the mindset that animals and plants are, you know, uh, like, like, I don't, I don't see them as sort of like stratified or like, you know, that old sort of um, notion of human dominion over the rest of the environment. Like, I, I don't ascribe to that at all. Um, I have a much more like eco poetic kind of approach to writing, but also just to my general um, thinking. And so, yeah, I absolutely wanted I literally, there are a couple chapters where, like, the main character who's, like, walking around and doing things is an animal. There's, like, one about a coyote and there's one about a rat. And uh, that, yeah, that was absolutely purposeful. Um, I really love 
like I didn't want it to be in like a silly way. This is not like, you know, Charlotte's Web kind of like talking animals who are just like people. They just happen to be animals like these are animals. They're just walking around like looking for food or like the rats running around the garbage dump like they're doing the things they would do anyways. Um, but we just get sort of like an over their shoulder view of what they're up to. And of course, they see, you know, strange things that are for us resonant and relevant to the plot. The animal doesn't really necessarily know what's going on because it's not their drama it's like human drama um but there's still a witness to it and and they they do kind of like structure the perspective of the narrative for sure this is also a mystery novel and there are some searches going on literally and figuratively so how did you map out the plot with that genre in mind oh gosh that was for sure the hardest part um it is my first novel it's my first even real attempt at writing a novel so um the plot was the thing that was like keeping me up at night at at the beginning even even more so than the challenges around the constraints of like not having gender or sex in the novel it's like how do i manage so many things happening i'm used to a poem where like one thing maybe happens and maybe even nothing happens you're just looking at something um so yeah it is is it, it is a bit of a mystery in the sense that we have sort of these two characters a couple who have gone missing and um you know there's another pair of friends who's looking for them and then there's a couple other characters who are unwittingly sort of coming across pieces like clues hints at what's going on and and they all end up becoming embroiled in this this central mystery of like where have these two people disappeared to i have a great interest i'll say in missing persons stories in general um i think because they're so rich and there's so much um like innate potential for them to go in so many different directions. Like, you know, we, these days, I think with the increasing popularity of true crime, we assume that there's going to be some kind of criminal element to the story, but that's not at all the case. I mean, people go missing for so many, so many complicated reasons. And I think that's a wonderful, like, depth and ambiguity to explore in a story. Um, So once I had that sort of like the central problem, these two people like disappear I have to say a lot of my process was like, okay, first I'm going to plot out chronologically like what actually happened to all of the characters. And then I had to sort of go back and be like, okay, but I'm not going to reveal it obviously in chronological order. Like that's very old fashioned. It's not very uh, exciting these days to have a chronological story necessarily. Um, and I also didn't want it to be a chronological story because for the characters, it's really not chronological. Like they're experiencing things often after the fact and then having to like work their way backward to figure out what happened. And so I was like, I feel like the reader should go through that same kind of process um, where you're constantly being fed information out of order and sometimes out of context. And then it eventually all comes together into a coherent, mostly coherent picture of what has happened, although there, I think there's still some prevailing mysteries at the end but um yeah it was I like to be honest I wrote it completely out of order I would write like scenes because I was like I know what I want to happen in an individual sort of like moment in time like these two characters have a conversation or these this character is going and walking around the woods looking for things or whatever and so I would write all those scenes and then I it was a bit like doing a cut up poem I was like okay I have all these like you know, there's 69 quote unquote chapters in the book. So I've got these 69 scenes and then I got to go back and like shuffle papers around and put them in a different order. And I did that several times and right up to the very end, like the one of the most recent edits I did with Amy at Palimpsest was like, we still got to move a scene. It doesn't make sense where it is. Um, and I, yeah, I, in terms of like guiding principles, when I was trying to arrange the scenes, like what I one of the things I really wanted was to have sort of a constantly shifting perspective. So um, there was no like prescribed like character A and then B and then C and then D. But I really wanted it to be like we spend a while with one character and then we're going to jump away and we're going to spend a while with another character and then we're going to jump away again. And so you get all these threads that are sort of being established, but it's not till like the very end that they actually like braid together. <laughs> and we actually are like, oh, that's what's going on. I think that was my intention anyways. Um, I was, the reason I was sort of drawn to that, like I use that metaphor of braiding. I don't even know if that's like a great helpful metaphor for me. In my brain it is braiding together these um, disparate stories. But there's a novel about the second world war, world second world war called requiem 
by Shizuko Go, which is one of like my favorite novels of all time that I like, came across completely by accident in a used bookstore. And I really feel she used that sort of um, approach to great effect. Um, you have these like disparate plot points and characters in different situations. And it's only over time that you even find out how they relate to each other. And that's like one of, that's really a central mystery. How do all these things actually connect? So one chapter heading is citizen science, which is a bit tongue in cheek, it seems. <laughs> but would it be correct to say that most of the characters dip into the concept? Are they detective scientists, naturalists? They certainly aspire to be. Um, and I think that's a little bit probably my own not bias is the wrong word, but my own uh, predisposition. Like when I was a little kid, very little, like kindergarten or grade one, or I don't know. So young, I cannot remember what age I was. I was just preoccupied with like Harriet the Spy and the Great Mouse Detective I and mean, like all these characters who are not official in any capacity, but it's like their life mission to like solve, solve mysteries, not criminal mysteries, necessarily, just mysteries, the mysteries of life. And I, I've always loved that sort of um, the curiosity and like the the desire for information and understanding and knowledge of like characters like that. Like they're not it's not their job. They don't have to do this. They're just so curious and interested in the world around them. Um, and I think that's all, those are also like helpful qualities in general in characters. Like if the characters aren't interested in the world around them. Like they would see something strange and they would just walk away from it. They'd be afraid of it or they'd be like, I don't care about that. That doesn't interest me. But having characters who are like, no, I got to go find out what that's about is, like, I think, just very helpful for an author because you can just put them in weird situations and they just they go for it. Um, but yeah, also, I mean, there's it's not a major point in the novel, but there's definitely like a sort of ambivalence towards the powers that be whether it's like the police who are you know just sort of disinterested in this missing persons case um or like i mean any of the sort of systems like there's really nobody checking on these people who have gone missing um except for their their friends and their loved ones and strangers frankly at the end of the day um and and so there is a little bit of like cynicism about sort of the social systems we we set up to care for one another and like the limits of them um and <laughs> not that there is a moral to the story at all but i think like there's certainly my own bias showing through where i think like you know it it is necessary for us like on a more personal level and a more communal level to show up for each other because you know sometimes that is all we have sometimes the systems do fail us and sometimes people do slip through the cracks um, and, and we really have to rely on, we have to really have like our own sort of ad hoc safety nets all the time to catch that. Time seems like an important element in the book. What was your approach to the concept of time in the book? And sometimes we feel like we're going back in time and then sliding into the present. What were, what were you thinking there? Yeah. Um, mostly I was thinking about, like, I, I struggle, I think cause I'm such like in some ways, such a rules oriented person, I really struggle with narratives that actually use time travel or that like are completely dismissive of like normal, like the way time works. Um, but I'm really fascinated by stories that have a lot of like a feeling of overlapping time where it's like, I mean, I don't experience time like I don't experience the past as a thing that's literally present, but I always experience it as almost like a veil that exists over the present um like it's hard to see the world around you without without the the sort of filter the the lens of like your past experiences like it, as if the past is always like coloring or tinting or doing something to the present interacting with the present in some way and so i think for me the way i sort of conveyed that without you know doing that thing i hate where the character's like oh this reminds me of that thing that happened before i was like you know i'm just going to do a lot of like juxtaposition um, and a lot of sort of like fluidly moving through time in the novel, like the novel itself is not concerned with chronology per se, or like it's purposely achronological uh, to show that it's like, you know, mentally or like on a level of memory and like Im impact, I guess, on their psyches. Like the characters are always sort of slipping back and forth between past and present, even though 
in their real lives, of course, their present lives are continuing on and are moving forward and whatever. But it's always, like I said, under the veil of sort of past experience. And the characters lean on each other for support in surprising ways here. But apart from one parent who appears while tired and working odd hours, are most of the characters distanced from their families in one way or another? Yeah, that was, <laughs> I noticed that at some point when I was writing, which is strange because I'm not, like, that's not a, I'm not distanced from my family. Um, but I think what I wanted effectively was, like, there are really a lot of, like, characters who are lonely in that, not that they don't have people around them, like, they there are people in their lives, but they often feel like they can't really rely on them or lean on them, or they might have, like, one person they kind of trust and they're a little suspicious of everybody else. And I think, I mean, I did that in part because I do on some level personally feel that way. I think a lot of the time I do find it hard to connect to other people and like fully trust them and and that kind of thing. So that might partly be like a bit of a, again, personal bias. But I think for the purposes of the novel, like I also really wanted these to be characters who find each other over the course of the novel. And I think in order to make that feel reasonable, A, for them to be like pursuing that, but also like impactful, they kind of had to start off a little bit lonely. Like they definitely have a friend or like, or a family member occasionally who they can lean on, but they are a bit isolated and detached. And I wanted it to be a novel of like them, like a novel of coming together rather than growing apart. And I think those are two very valid and common forms of novel structure. Tell us about the title Anomia, which loosely refers to people at a loss for words, and yet your characters are so articulate. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm glad they are articulate. Um, I think a couple of them have been accused of being overly eloquent sometimes, which is probably true and is um, actually somewhat on purpose. But um, yeah, Anomia. So one of the one of the sort of things that developed over the life of the novel at the beginning, I was like, okay, I'm just going to ignore, not ignore. I'm going to purposefully exclude sex and gender from the novel. And originally that was just like, oh, it's just not there. You'll never, as a reader, you don't know why, like there's just no even clue as to why it's absent. Um, and I was like, that's like in my mind fun, but <laughs> I, I felt like that felt lacking. Um, and I had, you know, some different people read it over over the years of its development. And um, one person had said something. They're like, I mean, you're kind of, you're like approaching the speculative in some ways. Like there's this kind of, not surreal, but um, like ethereal almost quality to some of the, the scenes. But you're not actually going there. Like, why isn't there anything speculative? And I thought about that for a long time because actually I love speculative literature, especially like kind of um, like slipstream where it's like, you know, there's just it's just barely speculative, um, but it's in there. Um, and I thought about that for a while. And then I was like, you know what, maybe like the the absence of sex and gender actually needs to be in some way like its own part of the narrative. So you have these people going missing. But I'm like, what if also the sex, like sex and gender were also like, there was a kind of a mystery around that, about how that aspect of human life also went missing. Um, and so there's some, there's some kind of like illusion. That's one of the, like, what I call the unsolved mysteries of the novel. Like you don't actually, not to spoil it, but um, that's maybe not as fully explained as some of the other mysteries in the novel, but there is this sort of like, um, suggestion that sex and gender are being forgotten somehow on some kind of collective level and so that that loss of language or that loss of ways of looking at life is sort of one of the the motifs um i think that's occurring and so anomia i was with anomia i was like trying to speak to that a little bit like a loss of language but also trying to preserve like a kind of irony where the loss of language is, is it really a loss necessarily? Um, or like, does it open up kind of other ways of speaking about people and life and things like that? Um, yeah. So Nomia was just kind of a nod to that. And it actually, it's funny. 
I didn't know what to call the novel for the longest time. Then I was just taking a walk and the word popped into my head. And <laughs> funnily, I couldn't remember what the word meant. And I'm like, that's the title for the novel. And I don't know why. And I don't remember what it means, but it's going to be the title. And I looked it up and I was like, that's perfect. <laughs> so. Do you juggle writing poetry and working on your editing with your prose writing? Or do you have, sep do you have to separate out those functions? Oh, gosh, I have a terrible habit of working on in theory, working on many things at once. I'm like, oh, I've got seven projects going. And the reality is that five of them I haven't touched in a year, but they're in my head somehow. And then two of them maybe I'm actually working on. And it's, it's sort of exacerbated by the fact that I also write collaboratively with my partner, Mark. We write as maid. Um, and he's of the same type where he has 10 projects sort of in various stages of completion at any given time. So between us, it's chaos kind of um in terms of unfinished projects on the go um i will actually say i find it desperately hard to write fiction i don't know how i got the novel done ever i think like maybe i never would have if not for my two years at the university of windsor for my ma which just was like well you know you have to get it done um i don't naturally write fiction i didn't write it for m many many years like i avoided it i was like i don't know I don't even want to look at it. Um, so yeah, it was very hard to come to writing the novel, to fiction in general. And I I procrastinate so much on fiction. I'm just like, that's the last thing I want to write. I'll work on every single other poetry project and also a couple that aren't even started yet before I will touch my fiction. Um, so yeah, I'm quite <laughs> one of my worst qualities as a writer. Um, but I am glad the novel is done now. So speaking of your other projects, you have another writing project with Maid that you mentioned uh, that you do with Mark Laliberté and with Palimpsest coming up in 2025. Do you want to share a little teaser about that work? Oh, sure. Um, so that's Zoo, Z-Z-O-O. -O. Um, and speaking of eco-poetics, that is very much a sort of book that blurs the lines between human and non-human animals and kind of... Um, putting them all on a kind of equal footing in terms of like looking at them and their lives and how they interact with each other. Um, there's a lot of kind of like spectacle in the collection, but also like a deliberate effort to challenge the, like the notion of spectacle, like just treating animals, for example, as like being on display for our benefit. Um, and so there's a weird like blurring between how we write about the people and how we write about animals and like kind of treating animals as not as characters per se, because that feels also weirdly objectifying, but like treating them as sort of agents unto themselves or like individual personalities who are sort of wandering through the poems, much in the same way people wander through the poems. Um so there's like the that misspelling Z Z O O is like a deliberate subversion of the word zoo. It's like there's an element of the word zoo because you are technically looking at a bunch of people and animals across the poems, but there's also um like a very definite attempt to to, to really like fuck with that. Can I say fuck with that on the podcast? Um <laughs> Yeah, that's zoo. We're very excited about it. It is coming out next year. That sounds great. So would you like to read some of your current work for our listeners? Oh, yes, I would love to. Um, I'm going to read a short excerpt, um, less than two pages, from the second chapter. I mean, it, it, in some ways, these aren't really chapters. They're more like little vignettes almost. But um, in any case, this is the second quote unquote chapter, and it is called Bear. Euphoria is a small town, so it still has one video rental store. Euphoria is such a small town that it has only ever had one video rental store. Standing at the cash register behind the glass counter that displays the scenic covers of special release movies and a brigade of posed action figures, Fear, who is average in most discernible ways and softening with middle age, often looks like a drooping background mannequin in a museum exhibit. The store is called Utopia Video. On Fear's first day of work many years earlier, the store owner had explained, 
I was going to call it Euphoria Video, but then my friend said that made it sound like we were selling adult films and I had to change it. Fear nodded in agreement, but privately thought that Utopia Video was a worse name, the kind of person would give to a religious shop with a conversion mission. Utopia means no place, Fear had said, not knowing what else to say. Oh, we've got a linguist here, the store owner smirked. We had to read about it in high school, Fear replied apologetically. As the years went by, however, Fear began to think that Utopia was in fact the perfect name for a video rental store in a town that seemed displaced in both space and time. Euphoria, an idle town built on fertile soil. The four seasons change continually, but the basic form of the town does not. Cozily buffeted from the rest of the world by vast swaths of surrounding forest, farmland, and freshwater lakes, Euphoria is forever buffering, culturally and technologically, decades behind the progress of the nearest cosmopolitan centers. The metropolises are a few hours' drive by car or by intercity bus that runs twice daily, once in the morning and once at night, between Euphoria and everywhere else, except, of course, on Sundays. Distance mutes signals. Even the blockbusters persistently arrive a year late to Utopia, and the closest the store actually gets to adult films is some tender-hearted softcore from the late 20th century, that last Arcadian decade before internet porn took hold of clandestine fantasy. For most of Fear's tenure at Utopia Video, the shop has had a quiet, dusty feel to it, even when freshly cleaned. But for the past year, ever since two people Fear knew had gone missing, working at the store has been more interesting than ever before. Each customer doubles as a suspect in the disappearance. Fear scrutinizes their rings for signs of recent cleaning, examines their shoes for neglected stains, and glances covertly into their opened wallets for IDs that are not their own as they extract credit cards and cash. There had been a close call about eight months ago, late at night, right before Fear was about to close up. A customer, thick as a stone pillar, came into the store with jeans covered in dark smudges. Painting? Fear asked casually, evergreen-flecked eyes fixed inexorably on the customer's knees. Butchering, the customer said. Blood drained from Fear's face. The customer saw it and clarified, as if to a child. Butchering cows? Oh, Fear said and laughed the way people do when their nervous energy has nowhere else to go. Nothing of concern has happened at the video store since that night. Until two teenagers, limber and sprightly, wander in amidst the emptiness of this Thursday evening. That's a wonderful teaser about the book. Thank you for that. Our guest today was Jade Wallace, and their new book is Anomia with Palimpsest Press, coming out spring of 2024. Thanks, Jade. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts, or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. For information and announcements of new podcasts, Sign up to our email list or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.